You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Tis the season to shine with H&M. Discover the holiday collection and find fashionable pieces for your wardrobe or for under the tree. Get inspired and dazzle with this year's glam. From tuxedo styles, bow detailed pieces, impressive prints, and more. From unforgettable looks to unforgettable gifts. With fashion finds to home decor, find it all at H&M. Treat your loved ones and yourself this season. Shop in-store or at hm.com. It's 1980, and the most unusual type of election is being held in the state of Iowa. If you like your candidate, they say, flush your toilet now. A radio station in Emmitsburg, Iowa, sponsored what they called a cesspool. Station owner John Shad was broadcasting remote from the city's water plant. He announced, Democrats who were supporting President Carter should flush their toilets right now. Now, it's more scientific than it seems. He's not going to, like, open the door of the radio station, just listen to see what he can hear in town. No. SCAD has Russ Harris, who runs public works for the town of Emmitsburg. It's a town of about 4,000 people. And they're going to be watching that water level in the town water tower as they do a remote broadcast. When he calls for President Carter, the tower drops one-tenth of a foot. That's about 300 flushes, water expert Harris confirms. Five minutes later, they ask about Ted Kennedy. And there's nothing. No discernible effect in the tower whatsoever. But Carter shouldn't be so happy because when the radio host asks about who is uncommitted, doesn't want anyone, flush your toilets now, Harris sees a huge drop in that water tower, maybe 600 flushes. It was just one of thousands of events happening across this state that were going to determine the next president of the United States and not as inevitable as it seems with the hindsight of history. Not at all. The candidate's small chartered airplane taxis into a tiny terminal building in Spencer, Iowa. It's a small town by United States standards, but in a state where a presidential caucus is happening, a town of 12,000 people is a veritable city. A former congressman from Houston steps down, and there's no crowd to greet him. He walks out to a waiting car. He's a former CIA director. He's former envoy to China former chairman of the Republican Party of the United States, and here, now, it couldn't matter less. No one's on that tarmac waiting for Mr. George Bush. Well, there's a few people. The town's biggest car dealer, and he has a nice black Cadillac for Mr. Bush. They ride off into the snow-dusted cornfield. Bush is the definition of a long shot. It's a hard thing to think about with hindsight, but that's exactly what was going on in 1980. Nobody needed him. It was not logical throughout the 70s that somebody named George Bush, yeah, a name you heard in Washington, and even got floated for Ford's VP very quickly and then gone. You wouldn't think that someone like that would be so important to the politics of the 80s, the 90s, and even the 2000s. Here we are in a state that is being decimated by... Carter inflation. In recent polls in Iowa, he was just an asterisk. In other words, you had the main people running, Ronald Reagan, favorite for his party's nomination after narrowly losing to President Ford in the Republican nomination contest in 1976. You had Howard Baker, minority leader in the Senate, John Connolly, former Treasury Secretary, former Governor of Texas, big names. Then there was an asterisk, others, including Phil Crane, George H.W. Bush. In the basement of a town hall in Harlan, Iowa, 98 miles from Des Moines, a man named Jim Carroll 
is setting up folding chairs. And he has some experience in setting up Iowa's unique system, a presidential caucus. He did it four years before in 1976. But it was a little different. Carol's caucus was in his living room, and there were 20 people. He knew most of them. Now he knows, though. There's much more publicity about Iowa this year. The attention used to be on the state of New Hampshire, and it still is at this time. But Jimmy Carter is president, and everyone knows he got to be president by winning Iowa first. So now, everyone wants to do that. He knows there's going to be more, so he sets up 60 folding chairs. And on each one, he places a poster of his favorite candidate, Mr. Ronald Reagan. He's also more prepared this year. Instead of just writing numbers on the blackboard, he's going to have a slide projector to show the results of the caucus so everyone can see the delegates that they're going to get to select to the Iowa Convention. In this non-binding contest, which yet has implications both nationally and the state in Iowa, so who is going to win the party's nomination? Because it's so big, he takes out a room in the basement of the Harlan City Hall. Carroll's projector unit needs an outlet with three prongs, and the town halls only got two-prong outlets. That's not his only problem, though. More people keep walking through that door. Fifty. Then sixty. They're taking all the chairs. Seventy. Eighty people. Even in this small town, he doesn't know all these people. By the time the voting begins, 130 people have entered his little caucus. And the result of that is going to be surprising. Yet the bandwagon in 1980 was all for Ronald Reagan. Gerald Ford, who had lost the election to Carter, privately wanted to come back, but he wasn't mounting a formal nomination campaign and wasn't sure he could get the nomination. So for a lot of the Ford people, who you might say more moderates in the Republican Party, and there were more of them in the time we're talking about 1980, it fell to the former CIA director to pick up that kind of group. Here's from Time Magazine. This is the loneliness of the long-shot candidacy. George Bush, 55, has lived this life for nearly two years, pursuing the presidency of the United States. He's traveled nearly a half million miles in 38 states, an effort that has brought him no higher than fourth in national in nationwide public opinion polls among Republicans. No higher than fourth. Here's what one of his campaign staff said. Uh, I was running campaigns, and this guy calls me up and wants to do a fundraiser. George Bush. I never heard of him. Supposedly been the director of the CIA. So I called a radio station in Dubuque, and I called some other stations to try to get them to come listen to him. Only one radio station showed up. One little tape recorder. They interviewed this guy, George Bush, and I still remember him. He sat there with his legs crossed, you know, like a preppy. And he had uh, his socks. And he had socks that had no elastic in it. And they were all down around his feet. And I saw his legs. I said, who is this guy? Yet, something is starting to go on here in Iowa. Sure, Reagan's a front runner, but George Bush has moved from one of, say, nine people who challenged Reagan, perhaps for the Republican nomination, to being in the top four. Bush, Connolly, Howard Baker, maybe John Anderson. The best, the best cracker jack, jack grassroots organization. organization. That's how I'm That's going to win. How I'm going to win. He's gone from the bottom to the top of the middle. And in Iowa, that's not nothing. Connolly's campaign manager even says, you know, Bush has a chance here. That's Iowa will hold caucuses in 2,531 precincts in 1980. And Bush makes a point of taking it seriously. I have been spelling out, I think, better lately the differences with Governor Reagan. Not to tear him down, but with one thing in mind, who best to defeat Jimmy Carter? That's the one thing we've got to do. Bush had put together the largest organization of any of the candidates running in the state. It included 10 full-time employees. 
he spent 300000 He had coordinators in 68 of Iowa's 99 counties. And he went to Iowa 11 times, spent 17 days in the state. What is he looking at? He's looking at what happened to Jimmy Carter in 1976. Doesn't like Jimmy Carter. He's criticizing Jimmy Carter's policy right now. But he liked what he did politically in the caucuses that year. He shook hands with people. He met people, sometimes one by one by one. And Bush was going to do that exact thing. He was going to replace Jimmy Carter in the White House using his recipe. Reagan, by contrast, had spent just 10 hours in Iowa. He was from Illinois. He'd been a radio broadcaster in Iowa in the 30s. He thought, that would be enough. I'll get that Midwestern crowd behind me. I'm the leading frontrunner. <laughs> Meanwhile, one of his opponents, Howard Baker, was covered in the New York Times. He said that while on the campaign trail, he gets a 6 a.m. call from Secretary of State Cyrus Vance. But Baker campaigns so much, he's groggy. And he mumbled something like, mm-hmm, gobbledygook to Vance. And Vance is like, Howard, Howard, don't hang up, it's Cy Vance. Oh, shoot. They talked. As the minority leader of the Senate, an important person, Howard Baker was to be informed on developments with the Iran hostage crisis going on in 1980. And Cyrus Vance delivers the news that he has to. And then Vance says, uh, oh, by the way, Howard, who did you think I was when I called? Baker says, I thought you were the Holiday Inn wake-up call. Where are you? I don't know. Honestly, Cy, I don't know. Civic responsibility and national pride. These are the tenets which have been embraced by Americans for over 200 years. We have always shared these qualities with each other. And today, we commemorate the opportunity to share them with the entire world. Howard Baker was known for his plain talk. Here's from the Howard Baker for President 1980 campaign brochure. Baker plain talk. Restrained government spending. Balance the federal budget. Enact a production-oriented energy policy. And provide incentives to increase savings. Big issue in 1980. Everybody says that, Howard. How are you going to make it happen? The answer from his own brochure, you have to know Washington to change Washington. You have to know Congress to deal with Congress. What do you have that other Republican candidates don't, Mr. Baker? Answer, electability. Of the three major contenders, I'm the only one who has won public office in the last eight years to overwhelming elections in a Democratic state, Tennessee. In reality, Howard Baker's known for just one thing we probably still remember today. He was the Republican during the Watergate hearings who asked about his own party's president. What did he know, and when did he know it? To define the possible scope of Richard Nixon's crime or innocence. Now he's running for the seat that Nixon used to hold. But there are some criticisms. Here's what one newspaper says. It's almost as if Baker wants to be president because everyone has told Howard he has to run for president. But he doesn't quite know what he wants to do when he gets there. He tries to cut into this, this void of substance that there's a perception of by taking a bold position. You know, I'm not always a compromiser. I call for the end of bipartisan foreign policy. We're going to start criticizing the president even when he's on foreign trips. Arthur Vanderberg, a key Republican senator during the Truman administration, used to say that politics end at the water's edge. He is going to break that tradition and oppose Carter. Foreign policy is too important for us not to be involved in politics. But even this gets good. Is is Baker being driven to the right because he's running against Reagan? Speaking of the right, another candidate is Phil Crane. Phil Crane is an ultra-conservative congressman from Illinois. He announces his candidacy in 1978 because he thought there was perhaps a chance that this guy, Ronald Reagan, on the radio all the time, maybe comfortable with what he's doing, wasn't going to run for president. But once in the race, he didn't get out when Reagan got in. Then there was John Connolly. A recent convert to the Republican Party, he was famously in the car. When John F. Kennedy was shot, he was also shot, but recovered. He was a Democrat, became a Republican. He's competing in Iowa as well. But Connolly's decided 
to run a 50-state campaign to compete for the nomination in everywhere that there's a primary or a caucus, not just focusing on the early caucus state of Iowa or the early primary state of New Hampshire. Some say his personality was not suited to the amiable living room campaign, the way Carter ran and the way Bush was running in Iowa now. And he didn't tend to listen to established political aides, Washington types. He sought help from old Texas friends when he needed advice. And they said, John, build up your national stature, build up your poll rating, and then take on Reagan in the South, and you'll win. Reagan's campaign strategy was different. His campaign manager, John Sears, looked at Iowa and decided he didn't want any part of this business. A bunch of people in living rooms making decisions. He was staying out. There's another issue they have, and it's Reagan's age, and particularly they want to avoid the front runner making any missteps. The more little speeches they're going to be recorded and people are going to see. Better to avoid it. Wait till New Hampshire. But that means the opponents in Iowa are taking free shots while Reagan is not there. At the debate, January 7, 1980, you really see this. And it's noted by newspaper writers and everyone. Here's Bob Dole, who also ran in 1980. I want to say, Governor Reagan, wherever you are, I hope you're having fun tonight because we candidates are. And if you're looking for a younger Ronald Reagan with experience, I'm here. John Anderson says, I think perhaps the real reason he didn't come tonight is he's been running for president for 15 years now, and he doesn't have anything much different to say. John Connolly says, Oh, how I wish he was here. I don't know how he stands on issues. I watch, I listen, but I don't hear much. Here's the New York Times. Televised political debates are more often lost than won. And last night in Des Moines, the clear loser was 1,447 miles away. Former Governor Ronald Reagan did not lose by sweating and appearing nervous, the way Richard Nixon did in 1960, or by announcing the freedom of Eastern Europeans in the manner of President Ford in 1976. He simply lost by not showing up, by declining an invitation and staying home decision that needled some Iowa Republicans. Here's Pat Buchanan. I was at a downtown hotel where George Bush was staying. Bush happens to get on the elevator with me and he says, Pat, I've got the big mo, the big momentum. When you're up against the front runner, The thing you have to show is I may not have a position in the polls, but I've got the growth opportunity. (laughs) It's not unlike being a startup company, speaking to investors. Bush strikes gold, too. They find a statement by campaign manager John Sears. It's almost unbelievable, explaining his strategy to the Washington types. It says, It wouldn't do any good to have Reagan go into coffees and shaking hands like all the others in Iowa. People get the sense that he's just an ordinary man, just like the rest of them. Now, Iowans don't like being taken for granted. Des Moines Register interviews salesperson R.J. Smith from that city. Reagan takes it for granted that we'll vote for him, but there's younger blood around. Maybe that was the real issue. Reagan's age. If he were elected in 1980, and every newspaper account mentions it, he would be 70 years old. Only 17 days after entering the White House, he'd be 70 years old. Now, I know that this sounds funny today because there's a debate as I'm recording this cast in 2023. We have a president who's 81. But it's really a serious issue in 1980. 61% of voters in a Harris poll said that 70 is too old, considering how hard it is to do the job as president. Most troubling about that polls is voters over 55 seem to be the most concerned about Reagan's age. Let's think about some things, though, to put this in context so we don't engage in presentism. I want to say two things in regards to this discussion. Um, 
It could be an easy layup for my history can beat up your politics, right? Because here's the age issue, and we have an age issue now. And Reagan ended up winning that election. Yes. But Reagan was 69 when running, and as the newspaper article pointed out, 70 when he'd take office. And if you look at Biden, he's 81. Now Reagan will be 73 when he runs for his next election. So if you if you fast forward four years. But the other piece of information that's necessary to understand is that Reagan did win that election. Reagan did serve. So we have an example of an older president. But I also want to say that life expectancy was six years less in 1980. And you didn't have that kind of baby boomer ethic that we have now where everybody's pushing what they do at an older age. This was an election determined by baby boomers, yes, in some form, but really the silent generation was voting today. So you'd see headlines like, Bush shows fitness, and they'd show a picture of candidate Bush doing sit-ups. In fact, if you were a newspaper reader, you'd get the opportunity to see George Bush jogging, George Bush doing push-ups, George Bush doing sit-ups. Bush's brochure would always show him jogging. And he'd try to get B-roll, you know, try to get media to film him jogging. Leading one frustrated Reagan campaigner in New Hampshire to say, please, can we elect Reagan for president and send Bush to the Olympics already? Reagan doesn't help when he makes a comment. If I'm enfeebled, I would be the first to know it. And I'll step down. That offer isn't putting the best foot forward. So the age question, though, looks different in Iowa. It's handled differently among people in Iowa than it does in in New Hampshire. In New Hampshire, the Reagan team's going to be a little more organized. They make a joke about it. When his birthday comes, they're going to have Reagan supporters send him birthday cards. They're going to have a cake for him. In Iowa, it seems to be landing, and there's a reason for that, the issue of electability. So it's not just about what you think as a Republican voter and who your preference is for president. It's also about how you think as a partisan and who you think will win the election. That's key. You know, we have hindsight, and in hindsight, it's a great thing. We know Jimmy Carter turned out to be a fairly... Uh, bad candidate in 1980, a one-term president, and it looks like that's inevitable. That is not how it looks in the beginning of 1980. Carter is coming out strong at the beginning of the year, and the Iran hostage crisis that will cause him trouble at the end of the year right now is having a rally around the flag effect. Carter is trouncing Reagan in opinion polls that show the dead heats. But when they run against Bush, they say, would you vote for Bush versus Carter or Baker versus Carter? Either of those candidates have a slight lead on Jimmy Carter. Age is one of the factors, but electability is there too, tied to it. It's also the fact that he doesn't appear in Iowa. That hurts. Terry Branstad is a long time, of many terms, in, at different times of, uh, of the governorship of Iowa, he tells Reagan, you're making a mistake here. Bush is already starting to be predicted as the second place finisher under Reagan in Iowa. But even that, he wants to back away from. I'm not going to be in the business of increasing expectations. Smooth. The questions are raised about Bush already. Like, are you buying this election? Is your support just coming from your organization? Are you gaming Iowa in so many words, just drumming up support, getting people to show up? His letters, after all, would tell people, okay, once they've committed to come to the Iowa caucus near them, he would then say, could you please bring a friend? Could you sign up your friends? And many were doing just that. But that leads to a counter criticism. And it's exemplified by Jack Germond and Jules Whitcover. You know, who would have been key journalists at this time in 1980, I would say kind of like the Politico of this time. And they focused on this conundrum of Bush's support coming from getting people whooped up about caucuses. Look at Mason City, Iowa. Look at the Mason City Lions Club 
Grimond and Wickover say. Here are the pillars of the community. The doctors, lawyers, businessmen, farmers, educators of Mason City. It's below zero. It's noon. And they're out at their Lions Club meeting. They're not going to miss that. These aren't people that can't get themselves to a caucus. But yet, when they're asked to raise their hands, how many people are going? Of 40 people, maybe nine are going to a caucus. That leads Germain and Whitcover to conclude that Iowa may not be representative. The voters who will take part are not necessarily the elite of the community, but far more likely those who have been most assiduously and skillfully persuaded. Hmm. Well, wait a second there. Are we voters just passive? We're just people being persuaded? Bush picks up on this and responds to this criticism forcefully. What's wrong with organization, he says. What's wrong with grassroots? Grassroots. What's wrong with it? In that same town in Mason City, 30 Bush supporters gather in a home, filling a living room, to hear a pep talk before the caucuses from Bush spokesperson John Walker, a lawyer from New York. He's also George Bush's cousin. They like that in Iowa. In a different part of the state, Jimmy Carter's son, Chip Carter, is going to be speaking at a Des Moines caucus. A few miles away from Mason City, in Clear Lake, Iowa, supporters of Ronald Reagan are also meeting supporters. The individual grassroots of the Reagan for President campaign in Iowa never stops, even if the candidate's not coming here enough. In Elkhart, Iowa, Nancy Huxford is hosting her first caucus. She took over from a longtime host who had retired. I like to have company over. So I said, sure, I'll have coffee and I'll have cookies. 44% of the 2,500 Republican caucuses this year will be held in private homes. And everyone who's running a caucus is noticing something. They're getting new people. Huxford said... She's getting twice as many. There were only six people in the caucus last year. The caucus she's running this year, there's going to be at least a dozen. In another part of the state, a new caucus attendee was Peggy Klein, a grandmother at the time of Iowa caucuses and convinced to go even though she had never before. Her husband and her sons were farmers. She walked into the private home of a neighbor named Margaret, wife of the doctor of Spring Township, Iowa, according to the Des Moines Tribune. Sitting around the room, aromatic with the smell of wood smoke from the fireplace. A mechanic, a construction worker, a hog farmer, a teacher, power plant operator, phone company representative, and Peggy and her two daughters. More than half of them had never been to an Iowa caucus before. Peggy Klein helps to slice some brownies as food and coffee is served. She raises her hand to ask a few questions. There's a discussion before they begin the caucus. People talk about their their desires and what they're looking for in a leader. It's a tough time for President Carter. So people ask Peggy, who are you supporting? She says, I support the president. Hasn't he made mistakes? Yes, he's made mistakes. But he's a good man, good moral man. It's who we need. He's honest. He's experienced now. And there's no double standard with him. Peggy will stay in the living room. The Kennedy supporters will go over to the dining room. That's how it's done in the Democratic caucuses where physical location is still part of it. And the Republican side, they're just making their preference known on slips of paper. Carter wins that Spring Township caucus, and Peggy Klein would be asked to join the committee that would help run caucuses in the future. You think I can do it? Sure you can. Okay, I'll take your word for it. Democracy in Iowa. You got to admire it, by the way. I'm not a fan of people moving the order of the Iowa caucus, but that'll, I'll leave that editorial comment just there. They're getting a much bigger turnout in 1980. In Story City, there were four people. Now, 146 show up at a local elementary school. In Waterloo, Iowa, there's a traffic jam. And it's so big this year that some bad things are going on, too. Des Moines voters receive calls telling them the location of caucuses to attend, and when they go there, it's an empty warehouse. Or, even more cruelly, it's a home where the person answering the door has 
no idea why anyone's coming to visit them. There is no caucus at their house. These were dirty tricks, attempts to get opponent supporters to go to the wrong place. A note in the Fort Lauderdale News, January 1980, said, The ghost of Watergate has crept into the Iowa caucus in its form. Supporters of both Carter and Kennedy have received these bogus calls. Connolly had an ad with former Governor Bob Ray of Iowa. Ray had made it very clear he was endorsing no one, but Connolly's ad made it look like Ray was endorsing him. He had to pull those ads. Now, the Connolly flyer going around talked about Ronald Reagan's pro-abortion position. Reagan was solidly against abortion. Connolly staffers said they had nothing to do with those flyers. Everyone was getting phone calls. One Iowan in Sioux City said, the Reagan people especially, they're calling a lot because they're late in the game. I start to hang up by the callers. Well, first I find out who they're calling for, and then I hang up on them. And that's who I know not to vote for. St. John's College is for students who seek meaning in their lives and who want to ask hard questions of themselves and the world. At St. John's, students explore 3,000 years of human thought, confronting fundamental questions while engaging with history's most influential works of philosophy, literature, math, science, music, political history, and more. At St. John's, our vibrant community of learners examine works as divergent as Aristotle and Aquinas, Einstein and Nietzsche, Bach and Baldwin. Together, students learn to question their own perspectives while listening to a multiplicity of others, opening up a world of possibility, thought, and truly diverse and respectful community. At St. John's, students are also supported towards academic and life success with summer preparation programs, Pell Grant matches, merit scholarships, generous student aid, paid internships, career supports, and a faculty-student ratio of 7 to 1. Graduates pursue careers in law, education, media, public policy, science, and more. Learn about our undergraduate and graduate Great Books programs in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and Annapolis, Maryland at sjc.edu slash podcast. That's sjc.edu slash podcast. Hey there, I'm Dylan Lewis, one of the hosts of Motley Fool Money. Each weekday on Motley Fool Money, we talk through the business news you need to know and the stories moving stocks on Wall Street. On weekends, we dive into the industry shaping tomorrow and host the experts, authors, and executives that understand them. Tune in for insights, a long-term perspective on investing, and of course, stock ideas, plenty of them. To quote a listener, it pays to listen. Check us out and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. Did archaeologists discover Noah's Ark? Is the rapture coming as soon as the Euphrates River dries up? Does the Bible condemn abortion? Don't you wish you had a trustworthy academic resource to help make sense of all of this? Well, I'm Dan Beecher, and he's award-winning Bible scholar and TikTok sensation, Dr. Dan McClellan. And we want to invite you to the Data Over Dogma podcast. Where our mission is to increase public access to the academic study of the Bible and religion, and also to combat the spread of misinformation about the same. But, you know, in a fun way. Every week we tackle fascinating topics, we go back to source materials in their original languages, and we interview top scholars in the field. So whether you're a devout believer, or you're just interested in a clear-eyed, deeply informed look at one of the most influential books of all time, we think you're going to love the Data Over Dogma podcast. Wherever you subscribe to awesome shows. Here's Time Magazine. Jim Carroll, holding a caucus in the town hall basement, is dressed in a gold and white West Point football jersey. He spent much of the weekend before the caucus, crouched over a yellow princess phone, his voter list spread out on the dining table. A plump, amiable man with curly gray hair. Carroll is married 
and has four children and works 17 years for the Lincoln Electric Company before moving to Harlan to manage the town's municipal utility. He supported President Ford in 1976 against Ronald Reagan because he believed a White House incumbent would be more electable. But in 1980, this time he decided to go with who he wants, former Governor of California Reagan. I like what he said four years ago, and I like it better now, he said. There's a problem, though. Carol's running this caucus, and 130 people show up, more than twice as many as there are chairs for. I'm Jim Carroll, he says, your temporary chairman, and this is your neighborhood caucus meeting. I guess we're a large neighborhood. And he distributes slips of plain white paper for the straw vote. I think I brought enough paper, but you'll have to use your own pens or borrow one from a neighbor. They approve him to be permanent chairman of the caucus. Okay, that worked out. And then he asks if anyone wants to say a word on behalf of any of the candidates running for president. He has a Reagan supporter ready to speak. But the president of a local construction company raises his hand and says, Yes, I'd like to speak for George Bush. It was unexpected. But he gives his speech. George Bush, he says, is the most qualified candidate. Business leaders are for George Bush. It's part of the Bush talking points. Others praise Reagan. One praises the congressman, Phil Crane. But there's no speakers for Connolly or for Baker or for Dole. When it's all finished, although Carroll had hoped that Reagan forces would dominate the meeting, the results of the straw poll that he chalks up on the blackboard, his projector not working, is that Anderson gets two votes, Baker gets 12 Reagan gets 53, Crane 9, Connolly 6, and Bush 48. Now he's going to have to get out the calculator. It looks like this group is pretty well split, he says. Baker's 9.1% of the vote, so we'll take 9.1 of 13. That would be 1.2 delegates. Jim, I think you ought to round off these numbers, someone says, and Carol, nervous about his calculating skills, decides that's a good idea. Connolly gets a delegate, Baker gets a delegate, Crane gets a delegate, and Bush and Reagan both get five. A split decision. What Reagan partisans at the local level would figure out in their meetings. But west of Iowa is what the press would find out nationally. George Bush, who had just 3% of opinion polls in September 1979, by January 1980, was showing a lot more support. And they're motivated by the fact that they don't want to be told who the nominee is, and they want a nominee that can beat the incumbent president. Out of the 130 people that show up in the Harlan Ward 2 meeting, only two dozen had been to a caucus before, and many of them went for Bush. And that's going to be replicated across the state, indeed, Bush will, will do better in Polk County, where the capital, Des Moines, is, and on the eastern part of the state, and he's competitive in the west anyway, and he's going to take the Hawkeye State. Surprise everyone. The impossible dream, he says. The asterisk, the asterisk of all of these all polls, these polls just, just four months ago. Just four months ago. Now, there's a side story that doesn't get remembered. While Bush wins, is actually a computer error that strikes Iowa they have this newfangled computer system, and they're getting all the totals. But in the western part of the state, the system malfunctions. And they do decide, though, they want to report a vote out for the television, and so they do. They report that Bush wins 33% to Reagan's 27 Now, it's not wrong that Bush wins Iowa. But when the actual computations come in, particularly from all those western counties Reagan's doing a little better in, the real vote is... 31.5% for Bush to 29.4% for Reagan. So you're turning a six-point lead to just about a two-point lead. You know, six points, that seems like a landslide, especially with the expectation that Bush wasn't going to win. So who knows if it could have been slightly different, but still the fact that Bush was expected to be second or worse and now beats Reagan Ronald Reagan was stunned by his loss yesterday in Republican caucuses in Iowa and said today he would reconsider his decision not to enter public debates and would probably campaign even more extensively in the New Hampshire primary than he had planned. 
Pat Buchanan asks John Sears, the campaign manager for Reagan, um, what happened? And Sears basically said they got the amount of votes that they expected to get in Iowa. Their people turned out. It's just they didn't anticipate newcomers coming to these caucuses. George Bush gets more people out. Sears is going to find himself out of a job. Reagan's going to keep him until New Hampshire and then fire him. I'm George Bush. If you want to know what inflation is doing to our country, visit a place where Americans work hard to make our industry the finest in the world. But inflation is robbing them of every incentive. Now, it's important this win in Iowa because it's possible we wouldn't hear the name George Bush again. I am the only candidate. Any more than we hear Howard Baker's name a lot. And I'm sure you join with me in these expressions of gratitude. But here, with a surprise win in Iowa beating expectations, a career and really a political dynasty is built. I am the only candidate that made a payroll. I built a business. I know what productivity is. I know what working for a living is and making a paycheck. And frankly, the guy that gets hurt the most by inflation is a person that has a job. Trying to make and it has effects on the larger election. Candidates were wrong to ignore him. John Connolly, for him, it's a clear defeat. He didn't get many delegates at all. And his 50-state strategy running everywhere was looking exhaustive and ineffective. So, John, you're just going to lose everywhere. The trouble is, if you look at who could beat Reagan, if you're trying to do that, right, in other parts of the country, Texas, South Carolina, Connolly would be a much better opponent than Bush in those primaries. But he can't face Reagan if he can't stay in the race. And Iowa and New Hampshire come first. Bush is also getting credibility from connections to business. A survey of 225 corporate presidents conducted by Dunn's Review showed as much support for Bush as for Reagan, Connolly, and Anderson combined. George Bush, a president we won't have to train. And after a tour of the Midwest, a top GOP consultant reported the businessmen are souring on Connolly, and they're turning to Bush. They don't believe John can make it, and they think maybe Bush can. Howard Baker has an interesting calculation. He likes that George Bush won. And I thank the citizens of Tennessee for echoing and manifesting... He thinks it's good for him. And warm-hearted spirit. Bush won in Iowa because he was there a lot, and I wasn't, he reasons. And the press is going to know that. I'm campaigning in New Hampshire. Dedication self-awareness and an individualistic spirit but this shows reagan is weak and the party wants a more moderate candidate who can beat carter and in new hampshire that's going to be howard baker my friends it is a privilege for me to stand here and to share in the pride that every tennessean that every american must have baker's prediction would turn out to be incorrect because bush's win was giving him as he called it Big Mo. And in Vermont, where not that many people had come for a breakfast that Reagan had a week ago, a thousand people show up for dinner with George Bush. Bush is also going to benefit from the timing of some of the primaries. If he can win New Hampshire with all of the momentum he's got from Iowa, and he does immediately surge in the polls. Massachusetts comes right after it. He can show a win there. Vermont comes after that. He can show a win there and rack up some wins early on. This last few months has not been an easy time for any of us. As we meet tonight, it has never been more clear that the state of our union depends on the state of the world. And tonight, as throughout our own generation... There's something else to report here. And it affects the Republican contest that Iowa is also good, incidentally, very good for the president, Jimmy Carter. Carter beats Kennedy in Iowa with 35 delegates to Kennedy's 19. Kennedy got started late here. He was focusing on New Hampshire, which is near his home state of Massachusetts. Carter's going to do well in Iowa, exceed expectations that he's kind of a failing candidate, failing president. At this time in Iran, 50 Americans are still held captive Innocent victims of terrorism and anarchy. Then go to New Hampshire and he's going to beat Kennedy there too. 
It's almost going to end Kennedy's campaign. Again, Kennedy's very stubborn and keeps running. And on the back of his Iowa win, President Carter uses the momentum not to just to take on Ted Kennedy or Ronald Reagan, but the Soviet Union. At least that's the way the White House spins it. Here's Time Magazine. Massive Soviet troops are attempting to subjugate the fiercely independent and deeply religious people of Afghanistan. He gave Senator Kennedy the walloping of his life at the Iowa Democratic Presidential Caucuses. Then, standing in the glare of TV nights, TV lights in the House of Representatives, the President sent the Soviets a forceful warning in his State of the Union. We seek to be and to remain secure. Let our position a nation at peace be absolutely clear. We will face these challenges and we will meet them with the best that is in us. And we will not fail. Let our position be absolutely clear. Any attempt, Any attempt by an outside force to gain control, to gain control of the Persian Gulf, Gulf region will be regarded as, as an assault the on States. the vital interest of the U.S. The House votes 386 to 12 to back President Carter's request that the Summer Olympics be moved from Moscow or to be canceled or boycotted by the West. Carter also grants China most favored nation status. This is an important development for what's going to happen with trade over the next few years. But why does he do it now? What does that matter? We don't think about this a lot of times in the history of telling our relationship in China. But one of the reasons we get closer to China, we the United States, is that China is a rival with the Soviet Union. They're bickering over the border, over trade, over all sorts of things, and don't trust each other. And it's one of the reasons Nixon goes to China, and it certainly is a reason to grant most favored nation status to China. The Defense Department announces that the U.S. is now willing to sell military equipment, not weapons, but things like uh, communications gear, to China. The Air Force fly several B-52s from Guam to the Indian Ocean, flying over Soviet ships to say, hey, we can reach you here. Shows of force. The Iowa caucus result, it seems, allows Carter to flex his muscle. And his speech is saluted by Democrats of different wings of his party. McGovern, more liberal, says it was a good constructive effort. Scoop Jackson, more conservative, said it's a good beginning. And hammering out a doctrine is important. Of course, Republicans are going to criticize him. Ted Stevens of Alaska say we're speaking strongly while carrying a short stick. It's important to know what's going on because in an election where there's a front runner and people trying to challenge that front runner, and if you're going to use that electability argument, you get into this odd, almost... Um, verse relationship with the opposing party. The better Carter does, the better Bush or Baker or Connolly can do. That's what's happening in this short period. Bush the asterisk is now Bush the candidate. Media's focused on him. He has some downsides, and one of the things is he keeps getting called an elitist or a patrician. His father... Prescott Bush was a senator from Connecticut, also a Wall Street banker. But he takes this directly on. He says, what's a patrician? I'll have to look that up. Does change his wardrobe, and he starts wearing less button-down shirts. Here's what Time Magazine says. The candidate likes beer, Miller High Life, and he likes country music, especially Dolly Parton and Crystal Gale. And he prefers speedboating to sailing. He's a baseball nut. Yet he clings to some of his Andover preppy phrases. Fantastic. Super. Gee whiz. Now there's more of a spotlight on him. It's going to get a little harder in that way. But his strategy's clear. Win these early races, get the big mo, have reporters start talking about Reagan's campaign in trouble. And Reagan does make... A few mistakes, but Bush does too. He has one of those dreaded bloopers. He describes Social Security as largely, largely a, welfare, a program. welfare program. Now 
then he has to hastily make clear that he's not talking about the pensions that people are going to get. He's talking about all those supplemental benefits. Not good. Another problem for Bush is he's building up. There's a small, normally unimportant event. Alaska has its caucus. No one really cares normally. Ford won it the last time. But Reagan wins, and he wins big. Bush wins Juneau, the state capital, and loses everywhere else. Reagan campaign makes a big deal out of this Alaska. Then Reagan comes first in Arkansas. Another small state, doesn't normally matter, but in such a competitive race, these are little positive blips for Reagan. Bush does win Puerto Rico, but Reagan had kind of nullified that by deciding not to campaign there at all. So just ceding it to Bush. So it's hard for the media to see that as a win for Bush. One of Bush's aides noticed something, and I find this interesting about the inside baseball of campaigns. It's like, you know, here's our problem. None of the other candidates are attacking us enough. Baker, Connolly, Dole, they don't go after Bush. They're still attacking Reagan. Bush wants to be number two, and they're not letting him. He's also got another problem. Gerald Ford hasn't ever said that he's officially not running. A lot of people see Bush as a stalking horse, a stand-in, who then win or lose, and then Ford will come in. So when they do polls, Ford's still present in a lot of these polls, which brings down Bush's number from where it might be possible to be. Some of our leaders say our country has to stop growing, that our children may have to accept a lower standard of living than we've had. Ronald Reagan doesn't buy that. Reagan is not passive either, and he engages in a strategy that really seems interesting given today's politics and sort of like social media. And this, is, this is before you had social media, and he just decides every day he's going to make a very extreme statement. Not attacking Bush, but attacking Carter. Well, it's nice to be liked, but it's more important to be respected. If he attacks Bush, he's lost. That puts the focus on Bush as his opponent, elevates Bush. He's not going to do it. He just keeps attacking Carter, but he does it in a way that the news media can't ignore because they're kind of wild suggestions. And because he's the right wing of the race, him and Phil Crane, he can get away with making a kind of wild suggestion. What's a wild suggestion? Well, we're going to arm Pakistan. This has seemed kind of a dangerous move to just arm somebody, but since India has been friendly with the Soviet Union, you arm Pakistan. What he can't know is that secretly Pakistan is being helped by the United States, but he calls for a Cuba blockade. You know, again, it's something that a lot of people want, you know, a lot of people want, but isn't a, has geopolitical implications that the incumbent president can't do it necessarily, but it's going to get headlines. I didn't always agree with President Kennedy, but when his 30% federal tax cut became law, the economy did so well that every group in the country came out ahead. Says that Jimmy Carter betrayed Taiwan. Now, it's one thing to say, like, I don't like this China policy, but he's saying Jimmy Carter betrayed Taiwan. I mean, forgetting that he supported Nixon's China venture, maybe grudgingly. He doesn't need to bother with that. So each day between Iowa and New Hampshire, he's making one specific, very bold announcement that the press just has to cover. And the thing about betraying Taiwan, that is a little bit of an attack on Bush because Bush used to be Nixon's envoy to the People's Republic of China. So without saying Bush, he's attacking Bush. There's something else. In New Hampshire, a poll of GOP voters, now it's only the GOP, says 70% of them knew Reagan was 69, and 83% of them said it didn't matter. This is the greatest country in the world. We have the ability to solve our economic problems, our energy problems, even our social problems. But along with this brilliant strategy, there are two key mistakes that Reagan's make. Um, there are two key bloopers for the Reagan campaign. And one is that he makes a, um, a really off-color joke loaded with stereotypes. It's unfortunate about Polish men bring, bringing a duck to a cockfight and a Italian man betting on him. And, and he doubled downs on it by saying, well, it's okay that I make these jokes because I'm Irish. It just doesn't go over well 
Nancy Reagan's in Illinois at the time and is in a very kind of tony suburb of Illinois and sees people and she's caught on mic saying, these are such lovely white people. And so she tries to blame the statement on, no, I'm just, you know, I was just referring to the snow. It was snowing and they're covered with snow. But there were no people of any other race in the audience that journalists could see. So it really seemed to fit. And that gets, so these two things are getting reported, not helpful to the campaign. But let's stop for a moment. And I think what this story of um, Bush's win in Iowa tells you and then heading into New Hampshire is that if you're going to take on the front runner, it's kind of like, right, if you, if you hit the king, you got to kill the king kind of thing. You, as the challenger, first of all, you have to beat all of those other opponents to make sure you're the number two. And then you really have to show convincing momentum to then become a significant challenger. And you really can't make a mistake. Reagan can make a mistake or two. Bush cannot. And the problem that he runs into is during a debate that happens in New Hampshire. Reagan's people have reached out to George Bush. They now want to take on this challenger who has got the momentum, take him on directly, a one-on-one debate. George Bush accepts. That's exactly what he wants, to be seen as the number two challenger to Reagan. If it's a Reagan-Bush debate, the FEC, none of the groups can pay for this debate. So Reagan says, uh, we'll, we'll pay for it out of our campaign funds. Okay. They bring in the Nashua Telegraph, the newspaper, to moderate. And really, just a half hour before the debate begins, Reagan's campaign decides to invite the other candidates. I don't believe this was like a prescient strategy, but it was also some that maybe both the campaigns were now getting hit by the Connolly, Baker, and Dole campaigns of being elitist, of being snobs. It was starting to look bad for Reagan, too, that just the two were debating. They were keeping them out. So Reagan brings them in. And you have this moment where Bush sits down, expecting to debate Reagan directly. Reagan sits down, but then he calls over the other candidates to sit at the table. People in the crowd, it's his high school auditorium and it's full and people are like, get them seats, get them seats. And the moderator from the Nashua Telegraph says, no, Mr. Reagan, you agreed to these rules. This is a one-on-one debate. Reagan says, you know, come on in. And Bush says, no, this was to be me and you. Chaos ensues. The candidates come closer. The Nashua Telegraph um, moderator A John Breen asks the technician, please turn off Mr. Reagan's microphone. And right then and there, Reagan, the polished actor, says, I paid for this microphone, Mr. Green. Forget that his name was Breen. Doesn't matter. Couldn't matter less. Forget that Reagan and Bush will end up having a debate without those other candidates. No one remembers that. All the news coverage isn't about a thing that was said in the debate. It's all about that moment where he says, I'm paying for this microphone. And it looks bad for Bush. How much of it was the debate? I think, you know, reviewing some of the events of this time, I think Bush had challenges. He had put so much organization into Iowa that it was hard to, to get that organization going in New Hampshire so quickly. And the fact that the other candidates didn't accept him as the challenger. But certainly the debate... Is the key event people remember and had a significant news impact. Reagan wins New Hampshire by 40,000 votes. Bush will end up winning the Massachusetts primary, but now it doesn't have that same like boom, boom. And with Reagan's wins in Alaska and Arkansas, now New Hampshire, he's got wins in different parts of the country. Um, There'll be a little race that goes on between Bush and Reagan. Definitely, a. if you look at those few months, it's a race for the future of the party, but it's not much of a contest because a more conservative candidate is winning out already in 1980 over a more moderate candidate. Corporate, business, Washington establishment type candidate. Reagan will end up winning Vermont, Florida, which Bush had had a lot of hopes of doing better in, and Alabama, which was there was no chance for Bush. A lot of momentum now shifting to Ronald Reagan. Now Bush is on the ropes. He does win Michigan to stay in the race. He's got the support of the governor there. And it goes to Pennsylvania. And Bush decides here 
to put $1 million, unprecedented for the time, more than Reagan has to put into the state of Pennsylvania. He has the support of the governor as well, and he's expecting a win in Pennsylvania to now make it a race again, to throw off what's now Ronald Reagan's momentum, shift it back to Bush. I wanted to wound him. Reagan does something interesting. The night before the primary, he has 36 congressmen endorse him just to kind of create a psychological lock on the nomination. One of them is Wyoming Congressman Dick Cheney. I think the race is pretty much over. Reagan can win in the East, the South, the West, everywhere. Bush will win Pennsylvania, but it doesn't have the same effect because it's dulled by all of these high-profile endorsements. In addition to Congressman Cheney and 35 others, he gets former candidate Phil Crane to endorse Reagan as well. Bush will win D.C., a few other, Connecticut, a few other places, but that's pretty much the end of the short-lived 1980 primary on the Republican side. But it was never inevitable, it was certainly possible, that Bush could have, if everything went right, knocked Reagan out. It's also possible that Bush could have remained an asterisk in history, and boy, would have history been different, right? Because if you don't have the father, you're definitely not having the son as president, which just changes history in ways we don't have time to talk about in this podcast. But Bush puts up enough of a challenge in 1980 that he's established as the leader of moderate forces, so to speak. Baker's out of the race. Connolly gets out of the race after South Carolina. And When it comes time to pick a vice presidential candidate, they first want to go to Ford. So Bush still isn't there, but he's at least number two in the minds once Ford declines and Reagan declines bringing Ford in. Bush is a natural choice. Becomes vice president for two terms. Not really close with the man he ran against in these primaries. The charge of voodoo economics is the one that will stick out, but some of the sting from 1980, remains in their relationship. Not the closest with Nancy Reagan, which was a key to being close with Reagan throughout the, his vice presidency. But of course, Bush will win outright in, in 88. It's an interesting race. It has a lot to do with some of the things you're seeing. On do you participate in debates? Do you win by not participating in debates? Do you lose by not participating in debates? How do you become the number two to a number one in a race? What's the effect of the other candidates on the candidate that tries to be that number two? And all of that, you know, you see in so many examples, but certainly present in 1980. I want to thank you for listening. The website is www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com. You really should go to the website if you haven't. Uh, myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com. I've got a lot of older episodes there, if you'd like. We also have a link to the Patreon site. There's a free episode about Desert One, the botched operation to rescue the Iran hostages and the possible what if there, and some other things. Thanks for listening. The Civil War and Reconstruction was a pivotal era in American history. When a war was fought to save the Union and to free the slaves. And when the work to rebuild the nation after that war was over turned into a struggle to guarantee liberty and justice for all Americans. I'm Tracy. And I'm Rich. And we want to invite you to join us as we take an in-depth look at this pivotal era in American history. Look for the Civil War and Reconstruction wherever you find your podcasts.